Hi, my name is Isabel Norton and I'm in Texas. And my mentor and I, Stephanie, Stephanie Nawas, um, did a research project on Im image classification techniques. And our, the title of our paper was Comparison of Machine Learning Methods on Adversarial Image Classification. And I'll understand, and I'll explain what those words mean in a minute. So what I'll go through first is our research topic, like what significance it has, previous research that has been done on it, um, and some background information on terms so you can follow along. In the methodology, I'll explain how we coded some the models and how we tested them and what resources we use, such as databases and um, libraries. And then, oops, and then I'll get into the results and how we compare the models and what we, what was shown and what this means for future image classification softwares. Research, what did we investigate? So corrupted or adversarial images are images that have been blurred or rotated or flipped that are corrupted in some way. Um, and it's inevitable for image classification softwares to encounter these, such as like a self-driving car. It's not always going to be bright and sunny outside. Um, it's sometimes there's going to be rain, sometimes there's going to be a tree blocking a stop sign. So image classification softwares need to be able to, able to recognize um, these objects, even when it's corrupted or being blocked. Um, so we investigated, we compared two ways. We compared models between KNN and DNN, which I'll explain soon. And we compared models that were trained with corruptions in the image data set or without corruptions in the image data set. And we were trying to look for which one does it better, which was KNN or DNN more prepared? Was the models trained with corruptions or the models trained without corruptions more prepared? Um, why does this matter? Why does the accuracy of image classification with different approaches, approaches matter? Like I was talking about um, with the self-driving cars, they need to be able to see they need to be able to be, um, there's a lot of public mistrust in self-driving cars. So they really need to be on their best, best um, working when they're out and about. So they need to be able to deal with these corrupted images. And there's other technologies such as, um, there's multiple health, most, multiple um, health institutions are taking advantage of machine learning. Um, to identify diseases in pictures, but what if they? Um, but what if this picture is blurry, or what if the file is corrupted, um, and it misdiagnoses it? What happens then? So here's the background information. What are some different approaches to image classification, and how do they work? So here I'll explain what KNN and DNN means. So KNN and DNN are both machine learning algorithms. KNN stands for K nearest neighbor. And that's the one I'll get. That's the one right here. So K is actually a parameter that you can change. So what KNN algorithms do is they plot all points on like this two, more like conceptually instead of actually in the code but they plot all of the data points inputted on a plane like this. And then once a new data point is inputted to try and classify it, it figures out which of the, of the previous data points inputted is it close to. And if I put K as seven, as you can see, it's going to look at all surrounding seven data points to see what this data point is. And then it goes by majority rule. So since one, two, three, four of these are red stars and three of them are green triangles, it doesn't matter that that's a, like a, that's a close um, second. It's gonna be classified as a red star because that's, it's just majority rule. It's pretty simple. Um, and the way it figures out how, which points this data point is closest to is through a um, concept called Euclidean distance which is basically Pythagorean theorem where it's like, it goes like this and goes, I could read out loud the whole 
um, formula, but it wouldn't really be any meaningful. Um, it goes like this here, and it calculates um, the hypotenuse between that um, triangle. And it's important to, to choose a good A because that can um, affect your accuracy. For example, if I made a made case, case smaller and only three, it would choose those three surrounding data points. And now this question mark is a green triangle, even though if I went bigger, it'd be a red star. Um, if I would have, there's, this is called um, overfitting, which is when I make K too small and underfitting is when I make K too large. Um, so it's too general while overfitting is it's very pinpoint on the data point and it doesn't look at any other possibilities. Um, So this would be called parameter tuning because I'm trying to find the best parameter that would output the best accuracy um, for all incoming new data points. Now let's go into neural networks, which are a lot more complicated. Um, so neural networks, there's a lot more parameters that you can adjust, such as layers of neurons and um, numbers of neurons within those layers. So for example, it says hidden layers right here. I can um, I cannot change these neurons, and I'll tell you why in a second. But I can change how many neurons I want to be right here and right here and right here, and I can change how many hidden layers I want. Um, these two are pretty input layer and output layer. They're pretty set in stone, though. Um, so let's get into neuron first before I go into layers. A neuron is an object. Um, that holds a number and it represents a function from the previous layer of neurons, unless it's from the first layer, which in that case it's, um, for image classification specifically, um, there's a neuron for each pixel there is, and then that pixel has an assigned, um, like from zero to one, or not always zero to one. It has a assigned like value rate, depending on how bright it is. Um, so input layer, that's automatically going to be how many pixels are being funneled into this. Um, and then the output layer is going to be how many options there is to choose from. Like if I was trying to um, dif differentiate a picture of a dog or a cat, um, it'd be just two neurons in the output layer. Um, more on neurons. A number is passed to the neurons activation function, which is like, human picks, which is like human brain activations. Um, neural network, obviously neural, it's some of the techniques are trying to base it or it's inspired partly off of certain human brain techniques. Um, and afterwards, there can be as many layers and as many neurons inside those layers as needed to recognize the patterns that connect these those pixels and to look like an image. So these layers in between are called the hidden layers. And I'm sorry, I'm reading off of a um, let's see. In order to recognize patterns, the patterns must also be broken down into things called features. So I can't just read, into, read a picture of a dog and, and it can't go, oh, this is a snout, oh, this is ears, oh, um, this is a long tail, okay, that's a dog. The, the computer needs more instruction and it needs to break it down a lot more than that. Um, these features do not need to be programmed into the neural network for image recognition because it'll pick, the, pick it out itself. Um, it's called supervised learning where the model is given both the images and the images labels to, to look at. And eventually it'll correlate certain features with certain activations, which lead to specific label categories. So if, if I would set up my neural network and I'd specify how, how many hidden layers I want and how many neurons I want in each of those layers. And then I would, in supervised learning, I would input, I would send in a training data set of images and those those images labels. So I'd train send in a image data set of like. 60,000 images of dogs and cats. And then the neural network would pick up on, oh, this 
these this picture that has these features is always being labeled as a dog, but uh, and it does not have these features as this image that is being labeled as a cat. Um, so we would pick it out like that. You don't have to program features individually. Um, this study uses deep neural networks or DNN, if you as you might have heard me say, which is which uses structure structure of the human brain as a basis for algorithms that train a machine to acquire intelligence rather than manually code the machine with intelligence. So in order, let's go into previous research. Previous research, what have previous research papers already analyzed about this question? Um, previous research papers, like, I was, like my mentor um, discussed with me, have already touched on how models can be trained with corruptions in the image data set. Um, to make them more fit to and prepared to um, analyze any corrupted images coming their way. But this is kind of, um, it's kind of unrealistic to pretend we can anticipate every single corruption that will ever happen. Like for self-driving cars, yeah, you can include trees blocking the stop sign in the data set or, rain, or where it's raining, but you can't anticipate all um, possible corruptions that could happen on the road. It's unrealistic and unfeasible. So how do we make sure that um, these image classification techniques are still safe? And how do different approach approaches compare? Making the models, what libraries and data sets were used? We used, so we made 12 models in total. And I'll break this down into four categories. Okay, so the first category is KNN or DNN. Six of the models we trained with KNN and the other six we trained with DNN or deep neural networks. And then each of those six, we trained half with, um, we trained half of them with corruptions and the other half without corruptions. So three with corruptions with KNN, three without corruptions with KNN, and then three with, with corruptions, DNN, three without corruptions, DNN. Um, and then each of those three, we trained with these image data sets. So this one, we chose these because they're regularly used in data science research projects and they were already processed. So we could have we could have read them into the model easily. So this one is called M N I S T handwritten digits. This one is M N I S T fashion, and this one is Cypher ten. Obviously, these Cypher ten ones look a lot more complex than handwritten digits. So that's going to be seen in how accurate the models are in reading any Cypher images. It's pretty funny because it's like I'll show you. Um, so we train, I'm sorry, my um, Zoom is blocking your part. So we trained 12 models in total. How did we test them? What were all 12 models tested with and how many times? Each model was tw tested 25 times during the experiment. Um, so, what we wanted to do was, like I was talking about how it's unfeasible to anticipate every corruption that could come a image classification software's way. Um, we wanted to test with random corruptions instead of like set corruptions, because otherwise that'd be a little contradictory if we set certain corruptions while trying to see how um, these softwares fare when they're faced with un pre unprecedented corruptions. Um, so we use three types of corruptions, blur, rotation, and flipping. Um, like this, this is, would be flipping upside down. This would be rotating, and then this would be blur. There was different, there was two sides you could flip. It would flip upside down or flip right to side, and then you can rotate any degree, and then you can blur from one to five of um, ex extremeness. So, I wrote a function that would send in both the model and um, the image testing data set that was used for that certain model. 
such as um, the handwritten digits I would testing data set. There's four data sets in total for each um, image data set. It was image training data set, like I was talking about where you send in the images and then image label data set where you would send in those images labels. And then there was um, image testing data set and image, I mean, label testing data set where it would predict what these images, Im testing images were, and then it would compare its accuracy against the labels that it actually had. Um, so the, um, so the, all four data, data sets were sent into the function, if I remember correctly. So it could corrupt the training data sets and, I'm sorry, only two of them were sent into the, um, what's it called, function. It corrupted the testing data sets and the training data sets were only corrupted if it was one of those models where it was trained with corruptions. Um, and then it checked its accuracy against those um, corrupted testing images against the labels. And it would randomize whether it was flipping upside or right side. And it would randomize, it would get a random number of how much to rotate and it would get a random number of how much to blur. So usually there would be like all three of these corruptions on top of the picture, which is pretty um, crazy because for the computer to read, because it's used to getting just like a six like this, but now it's blurred to the fifth degree, it's rotated 270 degrees and it's flipped the right side. Um, so it's understanding how much it dropped in accuracy. How do we record the accuracies and how are they calculated and displayed? So here is, is an ex excuse me, here's an example graph of um, how it was reported. So here, x-axis is levels of blur. This is where we, um, I wanted to make a example graph to like make it more easier to understand before we get into the heavy <laughs> scatter plots. Um, so here is de percent decrease in accuracy, and here is levels of blur from one to five. And you can see the decrease in accuracy is increasing as um, we blur it more. Um, we reported percent decrease in accuracy instead of accuracy itself or difference in accuracy because all 12 models, they're not going to all start at the same point. Um, after they were trained, they had an accuracy reported. Um, like they, you trained it and then you sent in the image testing data set and the image labeled data set. And then you reported how well it did um, on there. And that was its starting accuracy. But not all 12 models have the same starting accuracy. For example, the SciFar, um, SciFar 10 models that were trained with SciFar 10, the, the one with all the transportation and the dog and stuff, um, and the colorful, colorful images, that's gonna start at a very much lower accuracy than um, the handwritten digits is. And um, the DNN was already like 8% less accurate than the KNN to start off, off with. So, and that doesn't mean that DNN, DNN is automatically less strong than KNN. It just means that um, there was a limit of time as well with training the DNN because deep neural networks can be trained for weeks and you can fine tune how many layers there are and how many neurons are or within those layers, there's just an infinite number of parameters to choose from. Then KNN, which is literally, you just choose K. Um, so that was a limit with training the DNN. But in, but in order to take this um, like fall behind into account, we reported percent decrease in accuracy instead, where we um, took the original accuracy. It's like A in the morning. I can't remember the formula for percent decrease. Um, we took the original accuracy and we took the new accuracy it had against the random, randomly corrupted images. Um, and then we calculated percent decrease with that. So here's the results, part one, which is where I'll compare KNN and DNN. So here are the two, um, these, this is percent decrease in models trained with uncorrupted images. And here's percent decrease in models trained with corrupted images, but we're not going to worry about how those two compare right now. We're going to 
um, focus on how these red and blue dots compare. So first, let's uh, let's look over to Cypar KN and Cypar NN. This two little dots right here, it makes it seem like those neural networks did a very good job in saying and keeping its accuracy the same with the um, Cypar images. But if you remember, I was talking about how those are much more complex than Hamerton digits. So I think Cypar NN started about like 10% accurate. And from there, there's not much lower to go. There's, um, so it can't decrease that much any, that much more. Um, well, Cypar KNN, I think it started maybe like 30%, which is why it's also lower than the rest of these, because these the rest of these had a pretty good starting point, like 80 or 90%. So let's look at the models with uncorrupted images first, and then we'll see if that pattern is reflected on models with corrupted images. So I'm going to ignore the Cypar KNN because that's, um, it's, with the time limitation of not being able to train the neural networks, it did cause it to be kind of, I don't want to say useless data, but it showed how training your neural networks well at the beginning is important. Um, so digits KNN and digits NN or DNN, um, you can see the majority of neural networks were had a bigger drop in accuracy than all of these um, KNN tests. So these are the 25 dots. These are, um, each line is 25 dots because it was tested 25 times and run into the function 25 times. Um, so it's important to look at the majority of the data, like look at these as a collective rather than which is just more higher up because you need to look at it first to see okay, the majority of data is positioned right here um, because that'll be important later on where it's kind of confusing because one part is higher up even though um, even though the majority of the data is lower. It'll make more sense once I get to the part where you need to remember that. Um, so we can see here that the digital neural networks, they had a bigger drop in accuracy than the K neural networks. And that's the same thing right here. Um, They had a, hmm, I'm contradicting myself a little bit because this is pretty spread out, which is, <clears throat> this is pretty spread out, which would be kind of hard to tell which one had a bigger drop in accuracy because these weren't tested with same random corruptions. Um, every time the function was ran, it was a new level blur, new level of rotation, and new flipping side. Um, so it could just be that these neural network images, they had a pretty lucky time and they didn't um, get like blur five and rotate 50. Um, I'm sorry for my dog if you can hear her. And then now let's look over to model stream with corrupted images. Um, again, I'm gonna ignore Cypher KNN and Cypher NN because it's kind of hard to compare those two. Um, so digit KNN and digit NN, you can see here again that the digits and, and majority of the data was, um, it fell a lot more with the um, corrupted images than the canon did, even though it's a pretty narrow, um, it's a pretty narrow win. It still was more, it was less prepared to deal with the corruptions. And digit fashion canon and fashion NN, again, this, a lot of this data is really spread out. And a lot of times with data science and machine learning, you don't know why something is because you can't exactly crack into it. Like I can't crack into a neural network and look inside it that much, um, which, which is kind of like hindering when you're trying to think of reasons for stuff. Like why is KNN better? Why is KNN better than, oops, why is KNN better than NN in this um, instance? But with enough data, you can you can come to a conclusion. So the data here is pretty spread out. Again, like the same data here. And while well, Canon has the same patterns, if you can see this little space right here and this little space right here. Um, but let's try and look close and see which one had a bigger drop in accuracy. So I'm gonna cut off the majority of the data like about right here. And 
it looks i think kanan and then this was an exception i wrote about um where kanan was less well prepared to deal with it so results part two let's compare the corrupted train with corrupted and train without corruption so now how to train with corrupted images versus a clean training set affect both models so let me draw back a little more into methodology for a second um the way we trained the models with corruptions was it was set amounts of corruptions to mimic how it's were mimic how previous research was only training with um precedent precedented corruptions such as precedent and amounts of blur um like stuff you can pr predict like i can predict a self-driving car is going to be um obscured by a tree or s some rain or some people. Um, so it was in the image data set, data set. I split it in half and then I corrupted those, a fifth of those images with each level of blur. So blur one, two, three, four, and five. And then I rotated it at 15 degree intervals. So I don't know um, how many sections that would be, but it would be 15, 30, 45. And then I, flipped it upside down and then flipped it um, to the right side and then alternating like that. Um, versus the models with trained without corruptions, um, I just sent in the image training side that was already provided um, in the database. Um, so <clears throat> the green dots are the um, I haven't looked at this in a while. Um, the green dots are the, oh, okay. So blue are the K&N models trained with corrupted images. The red are, the red right here are neural networks trained with corrupted images. And the green um, next to the blue is the K&N models trained without corrupted with uncorrupted images. And the yellow right here is neural network chain with uncorrupted images. So basically the, the ones to the right are the ones trained without corrupted, without corrupted images. And you can see pretty easily now that, now we can start comparing SciFar to something. Um, you can see now that the models trained without corrupted images, they were a lot less prepared. Um, than the model trained with corrupted images. These are a lot more spread out. And the way, and again, we have to ignore it so far and, and then because they didn't start off very well. Um, and again, over here, we can see majority of the data has a bigger um, in decrease in accuracy than the models trained with corruptions. So you can see this again and again, these ones, the digits neural networks that were trained without corruptions, they were less prepared. The fashion canon, again, if we look at the majority of the data right here, well, the majority of the data would probably be like right here. There's just a few hours outliers right there. They were more the were, the fashion canon without corruptions was less prepared. And this, the fashion canon, the fashion neural networks were pretty spread out. So it's going to be hard. Oh, majority of the data is about right here. Majority of this data is about right here. So you, we we can still see how um, the without corruptions it was less prepared. Um, so that trend was pretty um, followed through on on all models. Implications: What does this mean for future image class classification and inventions? Um, so as I was talking about self-driving cars and healthcare system implementing more machine learning. Um, this provides a, a reference to see how well KNN and DNN do with, with certain, with different approaches um, to training them and with testing them. So there's new approaches must be developed in order to ensure that the accuracy range for corruption and un for corrupted and uncorrupted images for like life-saving or potentially fatal software, such as self-driving cars and life-saving like um, disease diagnosis um, is airtight in its accuracy. 
And there's already new approaches being invented, such as RAN, RAN train, um, which I'll get into, I'll read the names for the reference in a minute. Um, RAN train, which it would prove useful to bring deep neural networks models up to the same levels of accuracy as the KNN models, because the research paper was on, on how to make it more robust. Robust means more like flexible, more robust when faced with corrupted images. But it was like a different approach to training DNN models. And that was, that paper was written by Ji Young Park, Lin Lu, Ji Young Lee, and Ji Sui Li. Um, I didn't know if we were supposed to put our references in the um, slideshow, but I just wanted to name who was making the new approaches. Thank you so much for your time. Or let me talk about my mentor, my experience with my mentor first hand. Um, it was, she was so helpful. I went into this not knowing any data science um, models or any of that. And I didn't, I didn't even know that much how to code in Python. But by the end of it, I she had explained it so well, and she had like dumbed it down for me so well um, that I now feel like I have a pretty um, good or intermediate um, understanding of these of these concepts, and I'm very grateful for that because um, it was very useful, and I'll definitely be using this information in the future. She um, she was very open in communication and she always offered help. And she provided me with many resources on how to get a head start in um, knowing what KNN is or DNN is. Even before the mentorship started, she emailed me some resources and um, she, she provided me help like whenever I needed it. it was, she was great. And thank you for your time.